Welcome to Discipleology, a podcast where we talk about all things discipleship. Now we are relaunching and things look a little bit different than they have in the past. Yes, we're COVID distancing and making sure everybody is separated, but we also have new co-hosts and we're videoing this. So if you're listening on a podcast app like iTunes or podcast Apple Podcasts now, I think it's called, um, you can also watch us on video. So let me introduce a couple of new co-hosts to you. We have Mary Wiley and we have Chris Surratt. Say hello, guys. Thanks for having us. Hello, hello. I yeah. Think, I think I got to co-host the non-video version one time with you. That's right. When we Skyped in a guy in Syria. That's right. He was wow. overseas and uh, bad internet connections and, and absolutely terrifying. Yeah, but, but we did get t-shirts, so it was a, it was a win. <laughs> that t-shirt was extra small yes. on me. It was <laughs> it was very, very small. Yes. Uh, so I think that this is a podcast about discipleship. That's exactly where we should start with this relaunching of Discipleology. So let's talk about discipleship. What does discipleship look like in biblical time to be a disciple was to become like that person, right? So if I were to start following somebody, I would walk the way that they walked. I would dress the way they dressed. I would talk the way that they talked. How does discipleship look in today's culture? Well, I, I think it's uh, very similar. Uh, you know, if you look at the word disciple, it, it means learner. And so I think we get trapped a lot of times thinking that disciple discipleship is about teaching, that, that it's about knowledge. Um, you know, we fall into that ditch of it's got to be about knowledge, where really, if you look at the way, you know, Jesus started this whole thing. It was about following Jesus, learning from Jesus. The disciples followed him for over a year before they even did their own ministry. So it was about, you know, yes, there was knowledge. They studied, but they also mostly watched and they learned. And I think that's, that's you know, that looks should look the same today. If you're going to become a disciple, it's about learning one from Jesus, but also from people who are following Jesus who are around you. Now, the the methods may change, especially now with COVID. You know, you're not exactly maybe going to coffee with a mentor every single week, but hopefully you have somebody or two or three people that you sit with and and you're discipling or being discipled. So I would say, even though we're not following a rabbi, maybe. It, it's it's the same concept, wouldn't you say, Mary? Yeah, I would. And I think even when we think about discipleship in the home, we think about that same modeling, that it's almost an apprenticeship of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And I agree with you, Chris. I think so often in the church we think, oh, this is about coming to a class and about being taught something, when really discipleship and right right living for Jesus is often caught rather than taught. And that we can have a lot of knowledge and yet not really do anything with it, which can be honestly a really dangerous place to be in our Christian walk. That's interesting. Uh, So if we look at some scripture, we've got Luke, uh, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, Later in Luke, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Um, And then uh, the final discourse of John I'm the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. There is this concept of uh, growing and making a new fruit out of the, the vine, the life source, right? And so how do we then practically live our lives now? Yeah, the key there is what you said is fruit. Um, like I talked about the ditch of knowledge. You know, that's one ditch that we can fall into is that we're going to start new classes. We're going to teach everyone. That's how we're going to disciple. Well, the other the other ditch is actually about behavior change, behavioral mm-hmm. change. That uh, we can also fall into that ditch where we're just wanting people to become better citizens, better people. And so I, there's almost moralistic at that point. Moralistic, yeah. right. And so I think there's something that's in between that's that that Paul would say was transformational. Mm. That there's a transformational change that happens um, through knowledge and through uh, the change of the behavior. But then out of that has to be fruit. So are we seeing the change happening in everyday life for people living it out. Um, You know, are we looking for that change? And so, you know, when I talk to churches, especially churches that either major on the knowledge side or major on just the behavior side, they're like, how do we, 
how do we know if people are being discipled? Mm. You know, we know people are showing up for classes. We know people are uh, showing up for groups, but are they really changing? Well, you need to be looking for that fruit. Are they, or, you know, is their language changing? How they talk? How they, uh, you know, are they serving? Are they all of these signposts? So posts. attendance, attendance doesn't equal discipleship. No, attendance does not equal discipleship. And the same is true in the home, which I think often we fall on that ditch of behavior modification, yeah. where we want kids to obey because honor your parents or because, well, this is just the right way to do it without really taking the time to explain, here's the why, and here's here's what this tells me about what your heart, what's going on in your heart. That's something that we try a lot with our kids is when they go to timeout, which I have a four-year-old and a five-year-old, so they go often. Uh, but when they go to timeout, we make sure to have that conversation of like, okay, well, why did you respond in anger? Like what's going on in your heart and why doesn't that align with uh, the intentions of God or, or the way Christ-likeness works? And so helping them try to vo- use the vocabulary of faith to explain like, here's why I chose to sin in most cases, but then also really viewing punishment or, or discipline, not as simply punitive, but as redemptive. And mm-hmm. so having that conversation after timeout is over to say, okay, what have we learned? How are we going to live differently? Uh, how are we going to going to focus our heart to make sure that we're thinking about how God would love one another or how Jesus loved his disciples? And so I think discipleship in those moments does come from those conversations uh, where they are growing in knowledge, but ultimately they're learning to apply it not just to their behavior, but to their hearts. I'm thinking also that when I was a kid, I would have loved to have had timeouts as my punishment. <laughs> right. My my parents were kind of old school, you know, spare the rod and spoil yeah. the child. That's right. That's and right. so I would have loved some time in timeout. Man, you would think we were, I'm sure our neighbors have like considered calling someone before because we send them to their rooms and you would think just the screams that happen, like, it, we're just asking you to go to the place that you sleep every night. It's going right. to be okay. <laughs> but yeah, it, it works for us, which I'm very thankful we haven't had to figure out a different way <laughs> to you know what, discipline. I want to ask you, Mary, you know, what has been interesting when we look at family discipleship. Um, one of the, one of the issues, and I've got older kids now, one is graduating mm-hmm. from college, one is graduating from high school, but always, you know, we, we try to find the time to disciple our kids, to have those gospel centered conversations. And we're always busy and the families are always busy. But what I've noticed is with COVID, we have those opportunities like we never had before. Yeah. I mean, for instance, yeah. before all of this, you know, my church is mostly online. So we would, uh, you know, before we would try to f- find our seats in this packed auditorium, and then we would try to find our car in the parking lot, and then we'd argue about where we we're going to go eat. And, mm-hmm. and you know, we just, and then we'd forget about what the message was, even, yeah. you know, by that point. Now we watch the message sitting on our couch. And so as soon as it's over, we turn to each other and say, what do you think? You know, we have these conversations now that lead to some of those discipleship moments that we never had before. So I think that families really through all of this, we now have some space and some time to uh, have those conversations. Yeah, for sure. I think that we have a really great opportunity in COVID to set some standards of what discipleship in the home can look like going forward. So when we think about Deuteronomy of, uh, you know, teaching God's word when we go and when we come and, and writing it on our doorpost, that it's a great opportunity for us to begin practicing those conversations so that we can continue to have them even when we return to in-person church or we return to the busyness of everyday life. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like our family has really slowed down Mm -hmm. during this season, which has made it so much sweeter uh, because we've had more opportunities to have those conversations just pointing to Christ, pointing to the scriptures. Now our kids have missed being in person and every Sunday they're like, are we going to church? Are we watching church? Mm -hmm. Uh, Because they miss those times that are specifically for their age groups. But I think it's been a beautiful picture of what family discipleship looks like, which we often miss when we're just dropping kids off at their class. And so I hope that what we're going to see coming out of COVID is people committed to not simply allowing the church to disciple their children, but really feeling their responsibility to also do it in the home. Sure. It, it, it has slowed down quite a bit in my family, for yeah. sure. You know, my 
kid is perfect. And so I don't ever have to discipline her, right. but it's, it's held a mirror up to me a lot too, because yeah. I'm trying to disciple my family, but at the same time, like, do I want to disciple them in my anger or frustration right. that comes out and boils out? And you're like, where, what is my heart in all of this? Um, uh, so it's been, uh, COVID has been interesting to say the least. Um, one thing that I've enjoyed about COVID though, is the ability to, to go online. And so I've been, uh, meeting with a mentor every single week and I've been mentoring other people every single week. It's just yeah. on my calendar now. Mm -hmm. And so how easy it is to pop onto a zoom meeting versus, okay, we've got to drive to the coffee shop. We've got to hang out for who knows how long. And like, it is, it is almost regimented, Yeah. but at the same time, it has been so healthy and so much growth has come out of some zoom calls. Have y'all experienced anything like that? Yeah. I, when we first, when this thing first started like March, April, um, our group jumped onto zoom, like a lot of groups do. And up, up until then we had had like any group spotty attendance, you know, we had maybe 16, 18 in our group, but normally we would have anywhere from eight to 12 that would show up on any, any given night. And immediately when we jumped onto zoom, we had 100% attendance. Right. I mean, yeah. and this was back at the beginning when we were just happy to see anyone right, right. on the screen. It's so, something to do. Yeah. So it's something to do. Um, but another trend that I've noticed, especially with our group and some other groups, is this has also forced us to be in smaller groups. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, our group broke down into threes and fours mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And so I, I now meet with two other guys on a regular basis, which has you, – it's hard to do really any kind of deep discussion or accountability when you have a large group of people, right. especially if it's a mixed gender group, couples group. It just really doesn't happen. And those conversations happen best when you're sitting with – when I'm sitting with a couple guys. Sure. Well, this forced that. And so we have had some amazing discipleship uh, conversations that would have never happened if we had just stayed together as one big group. And I don't know that we would have ever gotten down to these threes and fours. Right. And so I think that has, and I think that's a trend that's probably going to continue. It's yeah. forced it almost. I think yeah. this idea of micro groups beyond just, you know, we're probably familiar with like D groups, things like that. But I think micro groups, it's almost doing life and doing discipleship with two, three, four other people. Yeah, that's something that we've done as well as we've moved to a discipleship groups model. So we're meeting with four to five people, same gender, once a week. There's also more accountability to attend. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're going to really miss you if your face is not on the screen. And so you there's get called this, out if you're yeah, not there. Yeah, and absolutely. people are texting yeah. you yep. like, where are you? Yep. Obviously, you're not doing anything because COVID. So get on your computer. So it's been really sweet, too, because the people who tend to hang back in a larger group are really having opportunity and, and feeling space to share their lives. Um and so for us, I mean, it, I hope that we don't return mm -hmm. to the broad, uh, you know, big teacher on a Wednesday night with a group of 40, uh, because there's a place for that. But man, the growth in these small groups is what just lights me up for discipleship. Like it's what gets me excited to hear what's happening in people's lives and how God's using them. Yeah. So when should we be doing discipleship? Tuesdays and Thursdays <laughs> are Between normally the hours of yeah are normally best uh, for no I, I, we do think of it in those terms don't we we think that we are going to do discipleship during group time right you know Tuesday night seven to eight thirty or we're going to do discipleship um, with my family on Sunday after the message when really it's a lifestyle right? It's supposed to be lived out. I mean, I don't think Jesus said, okay, guys, we're going to disciple now. So gather around, you know, for our time of discipleship. Right. No, it was, it was just, they followed him, they learned from him. And so it's a, it's a lifestyle more than it, in a program, you know, we'll tend to program our discipleship. So we need these classes or these type of groups, which I think is a good a facilitator for some of those conversations, but it can't be the end all of discipleship. So yeah. that was a softball question um, there, Andrew, but I think, I think you're right. It should be, it should be all the time. I do think though, in the home, we can really think, Oh, I need to figure out how to sit down and have family devotional time every night sure. with my family. 
Uh, that feels overwhelming. If you've ever tried to do that with small kids, like two minutes in, they're like, can I go watch a show? Can yep. I play with my Legos? Um, and yet I think that it gives us a lot of freedom to really think about discipleship as a lifestyle to say, we don't have to sit down. If that doesn't work for your family, then choose a different route. Um, that That is not the picture of the perfect family discipleship. Discipleship is simply walking alongside one another. It's taking advantage of those moments as they come. And so often I talk to families who are just like, we're really struggling with discipleship. And what they mean is we're struggling to have a family devotional around the dinner a set table, time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. a set time every day, which I love to encourage them to say like, there's nowhere in the Bible that says parents, you have to spend one hour every day in God's right. word talking about uh, the things of God with your kids. It's like, no, you just need to walk with them and make it. And we don't want kids to view God's word as something that's really compartmentalized. We mm. don't want them to. I don't want my kids to grow up and say, that's something we do for an hour every day. I want them to grow up and say, this informs every decision I make. This informs every moment of the life that I live. And I hope that we can also model that for them. Mm-hmm. At night when my little girl is going to bed, she gets one book but then she's learned that she's like, Daddy, will you read me something out yep. of the Bible? I'm like, <laughs> yes, I will. Yes, I Every will. Every time. Uh, so at the beginning of COVID, um, I, I tried to grow a garden. And it went horribly. Okay. But my thought process in it was, if Jesus is divine and we are the branches, how long it takes to make fruit. So you till the soil, you plant the seed, you see this plant start to grow and you get excited. And then I literally had zero tomatoes grow this year. Zero. We had big plants, massive plants, no tomatoes. Do you have like animals in your backyard? How did that happen? We do. We do. have. Yeah. <laughs> and that might be the case. But at the same time, like where was my fruit in all of this that I had labored over? Right. right? And so when is discipleship not fruitful? Mm. Man, that's a great question. Yes. yes. Also, I'm really sorry about your garden. Thank we you. did the Thank same you. and we grew the most expensive tomatoes yep. that I've ever had in my <laughs> life. Um, they were great, but there were a few of them and they cost us a lot of money. But uh, I think discipleship is not fruitful when uh, someone's heart is not in it, there whether that be the discipler or the disciplee. Now, of course, God's word says it does not return void. And so I do believe that even, even if our hearts are hard towards discipleship, towards what we're learning, that there's going to be this sowing of seed and That's hopefully right. that it will spring from the ground. But I mean, I think we see in the parable of the sower, even we see these plants that spring up and no fruit comes from them. And so that is something for us to be aware of is like, is this generating Christ-like attitudes and behaviors uh, rather than simply, and, and I think this is my big fear with teaching theology is uh, I don't want to generate people who know a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, because that just creates us as little Pharisees, you know, where yeah. we know a lot and we can prove our point, but we are, we're not living it. There's no fruit. And I think it is something that requires a lot of self-reflection to say, is there fruit in my life that is that is yielding uh, good things from, from God's word? I think we're also an instant gratification society. And right. Yeah. Everything has to be, right? I mean, we... I, when I was a kid, this will age me, but, um, you know, to see a movie, we'd have to actually go to a movie theater. Right. And then when I got a little bit older, you would have to go to this place called Blockbuster, <laughs> Andrew, where you uh, rented a videotape. And Interesting. Yeah. Large videotapes. Okay. Huh. And a lot of times the movie you wanted was not there, so you would have to wait. What until- did you do? It was, uh, it was, it was awful. I mean, I don't know how we survived, but anyways, you, you know, we stream things automatically. Mm-hmm. We get instant gratification and discipleship is not, we use the illustration. It's, it's not a microwave. It's a crock yeah. pot. Sure. It's going to take time. And so if you're wanting to see instant fruit, if you're wanting to see instant change, it's not always going to work that way. And usually it's best if it doesn't. Yeah. If someone marinates more in God's word and spends more time learning, and then you'll start to see slowly over time, those lifestyle changes. And sometimes you don't get to see it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, 
I've had people in my groups in the past that I've almost given up on, you know, it's like, they're, they're worth, you know, I don't know when they're going to turn their life around. Mm -hmm. And then I find out years later that, like you said, Mary, there was that seed there. Mm -hmm. And like one guy I'm thinking about in particular, I mean, he was one of those guys who wouldn't read the book. If we were studying a book, he, you know, wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't prepare. He wouldn't answer. He's now a uh, teacher in church. Mm -hmm. You know, his life is complete. It just, you don't know. So just planting those seeds and don't expect instant gratification give it time, let God, let the Holy Spirit do his work in them, and then you'll see the fruit. And that's a word for parents, too. Um, I, I think the the saddest parents I've ever talked to are those who feel like their kids are wayward, and they ask, what, what didn't I do? What did I do wrong? Why have my children not chosen to walk in the ways of the Lord? And I think it's an encouragement to say, you sowed seeds, uh, and the Holy Spirit hasn't hasn't given up. Like we're going to continue to pray, we're going to continue to ask Him to work, uh, but that th- those seeds very well may return return fruit. Mm-hmm. This is a great discussion. There's going to be a lot more discussions just like this. If you're listening to us on the podcast, subscribe. But also, I want to encourage you to head over to Facebook and to YouTube, watch the video, get to see us live and in person. And uh, shoot us an email, discipleology at lifeway.com. We'd love to hear your comments or leave it in Facebook and Twitter, all those fun places. We'll see you guys next week.